Good morning. Hope everybody is doing well today. As far as, uh, I've got a note here of announcements from Rick. It's in red ink, so I need to speak. <laughs> um, all who are sick with flu know we're praying for you. I know there's a lot of people down now with sickness of all sorts. I, my family itself has been down with sickness, so keep everybody in prayer and everybody on the list in prayer. An announcement, uh, Christmas Eve service is 6 p.m. So uh, we want to mark that on the calendar. And there's a new change on Christmas Day. Our uh, new service from Christmas Day is at 10 a.m. And no Sunday school. So we want to remember that. And uh, Rick has given me the scripture text for today. And it comes out of Luke. 1, 26 through 38. Now in the sixth month, angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. I lost my place. <laughs> now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, doing will be impossible. Nothing will be impossible. And then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be me, to me according to your word and the angel departed from her may God bless the reading and hearing of his word and also two announcements I want to thank David and his wife for outside I don't know if you've looked outside but it's it's beautiful thank you sing our hymns this morning. We have a special music presentation added by Susanna Himes singing O Holy Night. And I know you're going to enjoy that and be blessed by that. Turn, take your hymnals <clears throat> and turn to the hymn medley, For Unto Us a Child is Born. 143, 44, and 45 to sing the verses with the black girl. Let's stand as we sing, please. <laughs>
Thank you, Susanna, for such a, a wonderful rendition of Holy Night. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to have everyone in the house of the Lord today. Uh, this is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I uh, was hoping for a little more sunshine than what we've gotten so far, but hopefully the clouds will dissipate and we'll get some sunshine later this afternoon. But we are so glad that you chose to come and be in worship this morning and to uh, all of our faithful that uh, gather with us each week by way of uh, Facebook. We welcome you. We're glad that you're with us uh, today. Uh, before we uh, go to uh, the word of the Lord today, uh, I want to take a moment and thank everyone uh, for your help yesterday in serving the Fowler family, uh, bereavement mill, and all of the things that were done to prepare for uh, the service. I want you to know that it is very much appreciated. And uh, Larry, you absolutely just swung from I don't know where yesterday, yes. and you knocked the Lord's Prayer out of the park, and uh, so thank you for that, thank you for that, it was amazing, and I know that uh, it touched everyone here, and I know that uh, because of what they said, that the Fowler family was very uh, blessed by the service yesterday, and by the love and the kindness that was shown uh, by our church. And so thank you. Also, I need to uh, give a little shout out to our youth department. Uh, they had a uh, float in the parade yesterday. They won second place in the religious category. And You represented First Christian Church very well, and we are thankful for that. Uh, so grateful to have our youth group and uh, all of the kids that uh, participated in that. It was fun to watch, and so uh, uh, congratulations to them. Also, uh, I got a, a little note just before I, I came up this morning, and uh there's a celebration of a birthday today. A little girl that is 18 going on six or five, <laughs> going on five. Today's Addie's birthday, so happy birthday to Addie. Before service, she came and gave me a big hug, so you'd have thought it was my birthday. I was the one that received the gift. But uh, happy birthday to Addie. Uh, we're going to dismiss our kids to Sunshine Kids at this time.
While they're making their way out, let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. We're thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to gather together as a family of faith. Father, we know that you are with us because you are true to your word that where we gather together in your name, you are here. And so, Lord, today we are thankful for that. We ask that you would be with all of those that can't be here today, those that are sick, those that are perhaps traveling or uh, whatever may be going on in, in life for them right now. I pray, God, that you would be with them and you would care for them. Father, be with your people wherever they gather this morning. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be among them as well. And now, Lord, I pray that you would help us today as we enter into a time of ministry of your word. I pray, God, that you would help me to be able to share those things that you have placed in my heart to share and Father, I pray that our ears would be open to hear and that our hearts would receive it today. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. I uh, apologize in advance if uh, the message today is not uh, as refined or as uh, thought out as it could have been. I've had a couple of irons in the fire uh, this week, but uh, I do think that the Lord has shared something from uh, His Word that will be beneficial to us uh, this morning. We're in our third week of Advent, and we are experiencing Advent this year through the lens of the Gospel writers as they related the Jesus story from their unique perspectives. Now, I had Randall read a portion of chapter 1, uh, but today's message is actually drawn from the first two chapters of the Gospel of Luke. And uh, they are quite lengthy uh, chapters, and so your homework is to read that, and that will give you uh, a better understanding because as I minister today, I'm not going to take the time to uh, try to read all of those scriptures, but just sort of give you a, a synopsis and sort of an overview of what those chapters hold. Now Luke is unique among uh, the four Gospels in that it is actually the first of two volumes uh, Luke and the book of Acts were written by the same author, and they were actually written to the same person, a convert by the name of Theophilus. And the reason that it was uh, <coughs> written to him was to help ground him in the things that he had been taught since becoming a convert to Christianity. And the first four verses of chapter 1 plainly points out uh, Luke's endeavor to write an orderly account of how things unfolded from the beginning as it related to Jesus. And, and so he sets the stage by declaring the time frame as that of the days of King Herod. And then he introduces us to Zacharias and to Elizabeth. These were the parents of John the Baptist. And he tells us how that John the Baptist would be the forerunner to the Messiah. Luke then begins his edition of the Jesus story by pointing out that the God of Israel is the God of the underdog. The God of the underdog. Let that sink in for just a moment. 
God of the underdog. Now, how does Luke do this? Well, he does this by introducing us to Mary. A distinctive aspect of Luke's story is Mary's place in his take on the Christmas story. Matthew gives her an honorable mention, but Luke places her at center stage. The angel Gabriel appears to Mary. Mary visits her cousin Elizabeth, who is also going to have this miracle baby named John. And then Mary sings her song of high praise, known in religious orthodoxy as the Magnificat. Mary then gives birth to Jesus, and Mary treasures this whole experience and ponders the meaning of it all. And, and it all really begins with the question, why? Why Mary? What, what was so special about Mary? Why was she chosen? as opposed to any one of the countless other young Jewish girls of that region. We really know nothing about her, according to Luke. We can read the other gospel writers and sort of get a little better picture, but if you're only reading Luke's version of the events, we really don't know a whole lot about Mary, except that she came from the village of Nazareth. We know nothing of her family other than her cousin Elizabeth. And, and so Mary is essentially an unknown. We know that she's engaged to a lowly carpenter that is probably never going to be rich. And she's young, probably far younger than our culture would be comfortable acknowledging or that we would deem an age where she should be married. It's in all likelihood that she's just a young teenager, not old enough to have really done anything significant, and so she's a poor, young nobody from Nazareth. But when we zoom out from this particular story, and we begin to examine how God had worked throughout history, we see that maybe his choice of a poor young nobody from Nazareth was in keeping with how he had worked all along. The Hebrew scriptures show God to have a bias for the poor in a world where the rich almost always got their way. They show God as having the propensity to choose second sons in a world where first sons inherited everything. They show God as inclined to include women in his plan. Barren women. Women of questionable character. And even pagan women. In a world where women were often no more than just property. And so why Mary? Why a poor young nobody from nowhere? Well, maybe because that's the way God has always chosen to do it. Or, or perhaps it was what God could see that goes much deeper than just surface imagery. 
You know, man has always looked on the outward. But God looks on the heart. Verses 46 through 55 of chapter 1 records the text of Mary's amazing song of praise. And it's there that we learn that however humble her condition, she must have loved God very much in that she was willing to submit herself to the plan that he had for her life. We won't go into it today in depth, but there were a lot of reasons for her to have said no. She was really putting herself out there to be ridiculed and judged and chastised. The, the element surrounding all of this is not going to play well in most people's minds. She had every reason to say no, and yet she said yes. Overcome by all that was happening, Mary is stirred to offer this song that praises God as the God of the underdog. She even says, He mighty yet merciful has reached low to me. And because of it, all the generations after will call me blessed. But that song isn't just a personal praise about what God is doing in her life. It's also a recognition of the nature of God himself. To marry God is a promise-keeping God. That he performs what he says that he will do. And that everything that is happening to her and all around her is God fulfilling His promise of mercy to help Israel. The baby that Mary is carrying in her womb. As a young man, He would demonstrate that mercy by touching lepers feeding hungry crowds and healing blind beggars. And none of it would be for a radical political agenda in hopes of overthrowing the rogue government of Rome. Jesus himself would quote in present tense the prophecy of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are oppressed. That's what God has always been about. And it's what Advent leads us up to. The depiction of the arrival of the Christ child has been dramatized in every form possible. And there's been many a creative license that has been taken to make it more pleasant to our viewing. But more than any other of the writers... Luke shines the spotlight on the difficult circumstances surrounding the birth of Jesus. The journey of a very pregnant Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem. 75 miles on foot. Or perhaps Mary seated on a donkey if Joseph could afford one. Would you find it interesting? I've been 
preaching for a number of years. I've been revisiting some of the same narratives of Scripture. Would it interest you that not one of the writers ever mentions Mary and Joseph and a donkey? Not one. They're in all of our Christmas plays. Joseph comes leading an unshod mule down the cobblestone streets of Bethlehem with Mary riding on it, but that's not in Scripture. Makes for a better scene, but it's not there. We're not even sure that Joseph owned a donkey. But even if he did, how many of you ladies could imagine riding it for 75 miles <laughs> while pregnant? <laughs> or even if you weren't pregnant? It would have been a long, difficult, and arduous journey. It was not a journey that was made overnight. And so each evening they would have to camp somewhere. On the side of the road with perhaps others who were making the trek to Bethlehem to be registered for the purpose of being taxed a fee that many of them would never be able to afford to pay. And then they would have arrived in Bethlehem exhausted and dirty only to find that the place that they had hoped to stay was they had nothing available for them. No rooms. No vacancy. Early Christian tradition says that instead they bedded down in a cave that served as a stable, but we're really not sure what that looked like. One thing that we do know, though, it was certainly not the best of circumstances for a young pregnant girl in labor. No matter how we try to dress it up, Jesus came into the world in humble surroundings. And he came to humble people. He didn't come to people of power. Not to people of prestige, nor to people of prosperity. But to humble people. Like Joseph and Mary. The poor young nobodies. From Nazareth. The underdogs. We've met them, you know. We've seen them. We've been at arm's length from them and didn't know who they were. They were just ahead of us in the checkout line at the dollar store, or maybe it was Aldi's. She was that very pregnant young girl, hardly more than a child herself. Her dark hair was a bit dull. Her, her complexion was just a bit too pale as if she hadn't been eating quite right. Her clothes were just a bit shabby. Her shoes just a bit run down at the heel. He was standing close to her. His bearded face a little bit older but still young and in his face, you could see he was tired. He was weary. 
He, he had those telltale signs of bags under his eyes of being up early in the morning and late nights to bed. And his hands told you why. Calloused with labor and grime ground into the lines. We watched as he counted out his money carefully. And then slowly they walked toward the door carrying their bags. The pregnant young woman clinging tightly to his arm as if to keep herself from tipping over. Our curiosity peaked. So we moved to where we can watch them as they go to their car. It was more than a few years old and had seen its better days. But we watched as he gently helped her in. And then we wondered as they drove away at the youth, the poverty, and at the love that we saw. And never for a moment did we realize who they were. That when we looked at them, we were looking at Mary and Joseph. Jesus was born to them. He wasn't born in isolation. He was not born cold and alone. He was born into the arms of a family that wanted him, that loved him. The circumstances were humble, and the people were humble. And, and they were poor, but humility and poverty don't preclude warmth and welcome. And neither does it preclude love. Isolation, abandonment, betrayal, these are all things that he will experience in spades. But they're not for now. All of that will come later, but for now, he's loved. There, there will be a time when terrible things will happen to this child. Because that's what he's come into the world to bear. He, he's been born to suffer. That's the real reason for his coming. He is, after all, the Lamb of God. And the Lamb of God is born to die for purpose. To die sacrificially. But for now, he's loved by his family. The family that he chose. The underdogs. Luke's story is the one that we most recognize at Christmas time. It, it checks all the boxes that we are accustomed to in the Christmas story. It's got the Annunciation, Gabriel appearing to Mary. It, it has the Magnificent. It has Mary's song of praise. It, it's got the decree from Augustus, it has that journey to Bethlehem. It has the no room in the end story. It tells us about the manger. It's got angels we have heard on high. It came upon a midnight clear. 
O little town of Bethlehem, and away in a manger, it is all very tidily encapsulated in Luke's story. But it's got far more than that. It reveals how God can use the least among men to play a role in his redemptive plan. It's good news to the broken, the weary, the cast down, or the cast off. It's good news for the weak or the suffering or the struggling, the desperate, or those who feel alone. It's good news for the underachiever, for the unfulfilled. And those that seem as if they are always falling toward the back of the pack in this rat race we call life. But here's the thing. Some of the most insecure people who feel like they have nothing to offer when it comes to the kingdom of God are those who have been blessed in so many different ways. You see, God, even though He did not come to the powerful as the Christ child, is not against the powerful. Even though the Messiah did not come to the rich, God's not against people that are rich. He is not against the prosperous or those of prestige. God is for everyone who feels like he, they are the last one that he would ever choose. He's for everyone who has stood on the playground as sides are being drawn for teams that stands over there and they're just not quite as athletic looking. They're just not quite as adept as the other kids. And they know as it has always been that they will be the last one chosen. That's who God's for. Doesn't matter what our pedigree is. Doesn't matter which side of the tracks we live on. What really matters is that when God comes and He speaks to us, that we hear His voice and that we're willing to to say as Mary did, be it unto me, just as your word has spoken. It's about making ourselves available and allowing God to do the rest. Because he will always be what he's always been. He will always be Lord of those who feel unworthy, unprepared, and unqualified. He has and remains to be the Lord of the underdog. That's what Luke teaches us in his Advent story. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you care for us, and that not one gets left behind. That when you came with the invitation, it was for whosoever will. We don't have to meet certain criteria. We just have to hear you knock and open the door. 
you will come in to the rich or to the poor. You will come in to those that have made a success of life or those that are still struggling to find their place. Doesn't matter. The door is open for those that will hear your invitation and say, Lord, here I am. Be it unto me. <clears throat> Father, thank you today for your love. Thank you that you so demonstrated it that while we were yet sinners, you came to us. And Father, you found, you found the way to follow the plan and the will of the Father in that you became that sacrificial lamb for our redemption. And Father, for that today, we are so grateful. So draw us even nearer unto you, yourself. Help us to understand that Advent was not only about you coming to us, but allowing us the opportunity to come to you. Amen. Amen. We are going to worship together in communion this morning. If you did not pick up a communion packet when you came in, if you would raise your hand, we'll be sure to get one for you. At First Christian Church, we do not ask or require uh, that you be a member or anything like that. You are among a group of people today that we all are in the same boat in that we are all unworthy to come to the table of the Lord except that he has said you're invited. I want you to come. I want you to come and I want you to remember that I loved you and that I love you. I want you to remember that I demonstrated my love to you and that I allowed my body to be broken and I shed my blood for your sin so that you would have the opportunity to walk in relationship with me. So I want you to remember that and I want you to use the emblems of bread and juice. The bread will signify my body, the juice will signify my blood. And so it's a memorial. As you partake of these emblems, I want you to remember me. But I want you to do something else. When you come to the table, I don't want you to leave anything behind. I want you to come just as you are. I want you to come with your failings, with your struggles. I, I want you to be able to enjoy your victories and your blessings, but to know that I'm a God who, who's also, I, I remain a promise-keeping God. And here at my table, you can feel safe. Here at my table, you can confess all of your struggles, all of your sins, all of your shortcomings. And I will forgive you. You will come to the table in one condition, but you'll leave in a different one simply because you chose to spend some time with the Lord. I know we do this as a community of believers. Corporately as the body of Christ, we take communion together. 
But this is our time to individually talk to the Lord and let him talk to us. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread. He blessed it and broke it, gave it to his disciples, said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Likewise, he took the cup, blessed it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and drink all of it. This is the new covenant in my blood. Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for this moment. As we are gathered here in this time of communion, we thank you. Thank you for the Christmas story. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you, Lord, for the life you lived, the example that you gave. Thank you, Lord, that we can look to you and know that we are to be kind, that we're to be compassionate. Lord, that we are to love. Lord, that we're to reach out and that we're to embrace that we're to be your hands and feet. Thank you, Lord, that you showed us how to serve and help us, God, to do just that. Lord, thank you for your sacrifice. Only by your blood can our sins be cleansed. And Father, we're thankful for that today. And Lord, thank you for this moment when we can just bear our heart to you, knowing that we're in a safe spot, that you didn't come to condemn, but you came to seek and to save us. And so, Lord, today as this beautiful congregation gathers together, Lord, touch us, forgive us, change us to be even more like you, and we'll praise you for it. And we will give our thanks by loving you more and by loving our neighbor and serving each other so that we can serve you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Larry's going to come and lead us in our closing hymn today. I invite us all to stand as we sing. <clears throat> Take your hymnals and turn to hymn number 166, We Three Kings, 166.
again, we want to thank you all for being here today. If you uh, do not have anything to do this afternoon and you want to be blessed, uh, the school choirs will be doing their Christmas program this afternoon at 3 o'clock at the Civic Center, I think. Is that correct? And uh, it is always a magnificent time. It is, it is worth your time to go just to sit back and hear those kids sing. Uh, they always do such a wonderful job. And, of course, if you're an alum of uh, West Plains, you even get your time in the spotlight as uh, this Dave invites you to come up and sing uh, along with the choir. It's just always a special time. I guess it's a little bit more special to us because we have grandkids that are singing in it. But uh, nevertheless, if you don't have anybody, it's worth going to. So that will give you something this afternoon to do. And uh, all right. Well, you're liking Advent season, I know, for one reason. We get out early. <laughs> Advent, Advent messages are just a little bit short. And uh, but before we do that, I got something I need to do. Uh, a couple of weeks in a row, uh, there's been glasses that are up here on the pulpit, and I don't know if they were left so that maybe I could see the clock better. <laughs> I, I don't know why they're up here, but. If these belong to you, I'm going to put them back right here where I found them, and you can claim them. So, uh, and and I'll I'll use mine, which I can see the clock, but it's not very focused. But uh, Advent season, we've been getting out a little bit early on Sunday, so uh, that's my Christmas gift to you. God bless you. So glad to have you here today. I love you. I am so privileged and honored. To, uh, to be able to pastor such a wonderful group of people. You show love and kindness, uh, not on, only to one another, but to, to those that we are given the opportunity to serve. And I want you to know that, that I appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. God bless you. I hope you have a week that is tremendously blessed of God. As we're dismissed today, let's pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. The power. And the glory forever. Amen.